ever since I started my work in politics, I have heard stories and rumors of something sinister happening in South Africa. I was regularly sent images and videos claiming there was a white genocide going on right now. As a journalist, I have learned to never take anything at face value, to second guess and question it all. But I also believe that there is never smoke without fire. This is what makes South Africa so intriguing because depending on your outlook, it is either a paragon of multiculturalism and social justice or a powder keg with a genocide against the white population ready to erupt into an all-out race war. After doing some digging, I found an overwhelming mess of conflicting information about South Africa. Political turmoil, disappearing government funds, widespread corruption, and the sense that those responsible are never quite brought to justice. I found stories about the most gruesome murders imaginable with almost no statistical proof of their existence. I tried to put the pieces together, but there were just too many missing. With the left wing and establishment media calling the far murders a non-issue and praising the Rainbow Nation and the far right predicting a civil war, I thought surely the truth must lie somewhere in the middle. To understand South Africa today, we have to understand South Africa then, 366 years ago to be precise, when the wheels of history were set in motion. It all begins in 1652, when the Dutch East India Company, or the VOC, became the first European group to establish a permanent settlement on South Africa's western coast. At this time, the rest of the country was inhabited only by the Khoisan people, an ancient nomadic group who forged the land long before the black tribes migrated south into the modern day KwaZulu Natal. The VOC made its first purchase of land from the Khoisan people in 1671, establishing the Cape Colony in the areas surrounding what would become Cape Town but it did not treat all under its rule well, and many children of the settlers were born into indentured servitude. Seeking a life beyond the VOC, a group known as the Trekboer set out beyond the borders of the Cape Colony in search of a free, semi-nomadic farming life in the country's interior. They were joined by the first of the Vortrekkers in 1836, a larger group that would eventually form the basis of South Africa's modern Afrikaner population. As their great trek reached its peak, war erupted among the Bantu tribes in the north as they migrated across the modern South African border. In 1816, a king named Shaka ascended to the Zulu throne. Within a year, he had conquered almost all of the neighboring tribes who were vying for control of the region. This period is known as the Mfakane, the Zulu word for crushing, scattering, or forced migration. In 1823, a rebellion under Mzilikazi split off from the Zulus and headed north into the Transvaal region, where it is estimated between one and two million Bantu people were massacred, leaving the area almost completely depopulated. It was during this time that several tribes, the Umfangu and the Nguane among them, 
were forced to flee south, putting them on a direct course for the trekking boar. This was unfortunate for the boar, who had been making deals with smaller tribes in the area, trading favors, livestock, and weaponry for land. These deals between the boar and the Bantu occurred frequently throughout South Africa's history. It wasn't long though, until fair and mostly peaceful exchanges of land between whites and blacks gave way to violent militaristic ones. In 1828, a new Zulu king, Dingane, took the throne. Piet Retief, a notable Vortrek leader, was determined to make civil deals with the tribes. He was granted land for his caravan of Vortrekkers in exchange for the return of 700 cows that had been stolen by a neighboring tribe. After returning these cows to the Zulu, Retief and his trekkers made settlements on the agreed upon land. And in a show of good faith, the king invited Retief and a band of his men to witness a special performance put on by his soldiers. There was no show. Instead, the soldiers restrained Retief and marched him and 100 of his men to a bridge where they were beaten to death, leaving Retief for last. So he would be forced to watch the murder of his men and his son before he himself was killed. Dingane went on to massacre Retief's entire encampment, including hundreds of women, children, and many Khoisan people who had traveled alongside the four trekkers. The incident became known as the Winen Massacre. While the Boer advance across the country was mostly peaceful, the Bantu tribes fought ceaselessly, killing white, black, and Khoisan people wherever they found them. In 1910, following the surrender of the Boer to the British, the Union of South Africa was formed. It comprised all of the now established colonies and united them as one legislative union. For a time, separation of blacks and whites was only a social convention, not the rigidly enforced legal structure it came to be. But after the election of the National Party in 1948, what we now know today as apartheid, a word that quite literally means separateness, was formally introduced across South Africa. A slew of new laws, including bans on mixed race marriages and the Population Registration Act, which required people to register as black, white, colored, or Indian, were all introduced. And many of the descendants of the Bantu tribes were moved to the Bantustan areas, known today as the Black Tribal Homelands. In all aspects of life, Blacks and Whites became separated, often almost entirely. In the 1970s and 80s, apartheid became the focus of a global pushback. The UN brought sanctions, while internal resistance to apartheid began to find greater support. In the face of both peaceful and violent resistance, the National Party began a brutal crackdown. The crackdown only radicalized South Africa's anti-apartheid activists even further. In 1961, Nelson Mandela, then a member of the South African Communist Party, co-founded the Spear of the Nation the armed wing of the African National Congress that rules the country today. The group, often abbreviated to MK, publicly announced its existence with 57 bombings on one day. Ultimately, with the help of the CIA, Mandela was arrested and spent the next 27 years in prison. During this time, the resistance to apartheid only became more radical. In 1986, Mandela's wife Winnie publicly endorsed the new trend of necklacing, a form of execution used against blacks thought to be collaborating with the government. They would be forced to wear a rubber tire filled with petrol around their chest or necks 
before being set ablaze. Eventually following international pressure and the fear of a race-based civil war, the National Party released Mandela and entered into negotiations with the African National Congress, formally ending apartheid in 1991. Three years later, Mandela led the party to victory in South Africa's first multiracial election, securing his presidency and bringing about a new constitution, emphasizing racial reconciliation. South Africa is a young democracy, and the country still faces great obstacles, like deciding who has the right to parts of land still owned by the Afrikaner minority, something that has come to be known as the land issue, and which is tied closely to attacks on farmers. It is this divided South Africa that I am stepping into today. Within hours of touching down in South Africa, I saw protests and rioting across the nation plastered on every TV screen. But there were hardly enough news channels to encompass even a fraction of the true chaos. As we drove from the airport, my guide told me that protesters had burned down the town hall. He said this happened every day, but every day was an understatement. While simply in transit to our next filming location, we drove past a nature reserve that was still ablaze. It was intense as I realized this was my first real glimpse of South Africa. But little did I know at the time, this burning building was only a mild symptom of a much deeper issue that plagued the nation. It's an ongoing thing, you know, people get discontented and they destroy. There's a sort of a schadenfreude in the thing, not because I say so, but because a casual examination of the thing reveals that it's true. There has been for many years, going back to apartheid, but currently too, a habit of burning down schools if the children are discontented with the, 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 the headmaster, for example. In South Africa now, where we're following the burning of 13 schools in the country's Limpopo province, the protest broke out over a district boundaries dispute. Protesters say moves to include their neighborhoods into a new municipality would delay efforts to get them better housing and water. Government officials appealed for an end to the violence, saying it's affected the education of hundreds of children. The number of municipal buildings that has been burnt down in South Africa over the past, let's say, 30 years, uh, runs to, I would say, comfortably a thousand. Very, very comfortably. My instinct is to say three or four thousand. If I total up all of the, the stories that I've read, you know, in passing in newspapers uh, over the past, 30 years. While I had come here to investigate the farm murders, I quickly learned the problems here were far more prolific. On average, the country sees 32 protests over schooling, education, land, and infrastructure every single day. And the cost of damage to South Africa's university buildings alone has already soared well above 45 million US dollars. There was clearly more at play here than I first thought. So I pressed on, determined to find the truth. When investigating the farm murders, I was met with a remarkable scarcity of information. The government statistics did not report any rise or increase, and the BBC and other mainstream outlets echoed this position. I wanted to know 
why the murders of South Africa's rural white minority were so different from the rest of the crime in this country. And when I dug deeper, I discovered the Blood Sisters, an organization that works with government contracts to clean up crime scenes across South Africa. And I figured surely, if anyone, they would know what the reality of these numbers really looked like. Um, my name is Eileen de Jager. I'm one of the Blood Sisters, uh, known in South Africa. Uh, we are a nationwide leader in crime scene cleanup. Have you seen an increase in these kind of attacks in recent years? Absolutely. Um, in, well, 18 years ago when we started this business, there was attacks. Uh, according to our knowledge and what we experienced, they started weekly. We would get one call a week to come and assist at an either farm attack or farm murder. Now it's daily. It's definitely daily. It's increased unbelievably. Between 2012 and 2016, the attacks on small holding farms or properties deemed as a farm or an area non-residential has increased by an average of 72.9%. The figures that I've just given you is, according to our statistics, uh, government statistics will differ. I don't suppose you can tell us much about why that is. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, um, I don't work closely with them because we don't do every scene, but their, their figures are fundamentally lower than ours. I don't, I don't have a particular reason for that. I could, I don't wish to divulge on that. Mm. Okay. This was the first time on camera a qualified government associate had confirmed my worst fears. Not only are the farm murders real, the genuine numbers are much higher than we imagined. But I wanted to know more. In a country that already has extensive murder rates, why are these so much worse? Farm murders are one of the most gruesome kind of crime scenes that we have to deal with, uh, especially, well, well, in South Africa. Um, farm murders are intentional, it's not robberies, it's, it's intention, the, the intention of the attackers is, uh, according to us and what we've seen, is to kill. It's been classified, especially on the crime stats as well, that it's uh, attacks or robberies, burglaries. But because there is no statistic for farm murders uh, currently uh, in South Africa, um, the, the brutal, the brutality of the four murders in South Africa is undescribable. We found pieces of nails being pulled out. We found, um, we found hands being removed from bodies. We found people raped, uh, murdered, brut uh, brutally murdered, uh, babies, children. Uh, the farmers trying to protect their families, and, and there's just no stopping. Um, the, the farm murders are brutal. Another one that stays with me is in Johannesburg, just outside Johannesburg. We had a farm murder where Five people came in, it was arranged by their domestic worker, um, and they drowned the 12-year-old boy in boiling hot water. So we had to remove the skin from the bath as, as it was peeling off him in the, the hot water. That was a terrible scene. If you look at the worst, worst movies ever made, it's not really a patch against what is really going on there. It's unbelievable. Having heard from the far right corners of the internet that these murders were racially based, I was intent on finding out what motives the Blood Sisters attributed to these kinds of attacks. 90% of the increase we found is uh, due to unemployment, 
um, racial discrimination and um, there's just no there's no hope if you don't start your own business in South Africa where are you going to work there's no work racial discrimination against you if you don't mind me asking yeah I have to be careful, careful. yeah because I have I to be a little bit careful uh, we work very closely with government yeah and, uh, I spoke to Simon about it outside and he said mm. racial discrimination against people People, I know what you. I know what you have to say, and uh, no, 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 it's okay. gonna, we have to be so careful. Yeah, I, I have to think. We love everybody to hear what we have to say. We want to say so much more, but we have to exercise so much restraint. Anonymously, stay behind and work. I will here. tell you a lot of stuff. I knew I had to investigate further. I had to meet the families caught up in these attacks, so I traveled to the heartland of South Africa, where these murders take place every single day. The history goes back, we, we are now third generation on this farm, third generation. My grandfather arrived here in the 1800s. He died of a heart attack. And then my dad inherited this portion and his brother inherited the top farm, which my dad eventually over the years bought back. So it's been in the family for more than 100 years. Um, myself and my three siblings grew up here, went to school in Croftnet, which I'm sure you came through, and then went to study in Cape Town. And yeah, it was always our dream to come back. And it was always the intention to come back. Not under these circumstances, though. My dad was living alone. My mum was in an Alzheimer's home. So this is quite hard. And um, there was this guy, Sally, and he lay in wait for my dad. And at nine o'clock that night, he knocked on the back door. My dad opened, opened the door and um, he shot my dad in the stomach. My dad managed to get to the phone to phone my aunt. And... Um, and then he found the neighbour and said, this I've been shot. And the neighbour could hear the rest of the gunshots. And then the phone went dead. There were eight shots. There was one shot that Rick showed against that wall. All the time my dad's being shot. Back, arms, legs. And my dad slumped over this chair, slumped forward over this chair and he was shot in the back of the head here. Just execution style, in the back of the head. So it was eight, they found eight cartridges, but six, he was shot six times. Who came and found him here? Um, my aunt and friends of theirs, I think there were four farmers. One of the people that were here on the scene was studying to be a doctor that tried CPR. But he was dead by the time they got here. He, he'd already succumbed to his injuries. Yeah, so this is where my dad died. He was killed. Okay. I know, for what, you know, for what? He was a good man. He was an awesome man. And to shoot somebody six times, execution style. My dad was, I knew he would back me up and everybody would back me up. My, my dad was the most loving person. To cold blooded just get it. For, and so all they took, um, about 20,000 rand in the safe, they took that, helped themselves to food in the fridge, and then hit the road and then bumped into, well, saw all the farmers arriving and ran. And they spent the night, the two of them, at one of the farms and got back to Aberdeen. And by Saturday morning, the farmers had caught him, caught both of them. The farmers, not the police. The farmers. It was a tip-off. Um, 
and the farmers caught him and um, and eventually the police apprehended him. So were, were these people brought to justice? They got 15 years. 15 years. So, you know, if with these 15 years, he can sit for six, six years and he'll come back. And he'll, he'll probably come and kill us or kill another farmer because he knows how easy it is that he's got away with it. But no, no remorse whatsoever. Nothing, nothing. He spun so many stories in court that the judge eventually just said, rather keep quiet because I don't believe you. So justice hasn't been served yet. Listening to Janine's story, standing in the exact spot it had happened, was intensely uncomfortable. But it would not be the only sobering story I heard that day. Just hours after sitting with Janine and only 50 miles away, we entered the farm of another family who had been tormented by the nation's growing crime wave. The Haas family have had to go to extraordinary measures to protect their family after their father was shot in the face during an attack at their home. I woke up one morning and heard a terrible noise. My son and my little daughter were in the house and I don't know why, but I just screamed. It happened so fast. I ran to my bedroom window and I just saw people jumping over the wall and it was already over. I went outside and I saw the blood. Only then did I realise my husband had been shot. The marks are still on the wall. You hear about this every day. There's not a week that goes by without a farm attack. My husband survived the attack, but others are not as lucky as us. Seeing the scars and the impact watching this attack unfold at their home has had on this family brought the situation in South Africa into sharp focus for me. And the security measures the electric fences, the thermal cameras, as well as a closet stocked with guns and weaponry, now serve as a daily reminder of what happened here for a family that is already struggling to heal. During the week, I'm alone here. My kids go to boarding school and I almost never go out. I always lock everything. It's had a huge effect on my life. My fears are for another attack. My peace has been stolen. I just never feel safe in my own home. Outside the charmed world of rich and famous influencers who paint a story of security and prosperity from within their gated communities in Johannesburg and Cape Town, it seemed everywhere in South Africa there was a story of tragedy and bloodshed to be told. Yes, my, my mother-in-law was murdered here in uh, 2008, uh, January 2008, uh, they had uh, uh, strangled her and with a, a, a belt of her, uh, a belt around her neck and they take out her eyes with a fork and they Prick her with a with a fork. Her whole body was pricked with a fork, and uh, it was very cruel, very very cruel. Okay. 
You see, the problem is I will never go back and buy a farm there. I will not. It, it, it's too risky, too capital intensive, in, you know, to make yourself safety because you're not safety even if you're on a tractor. It doesn't matter where, they, because they ambush you. I'm not scared. I'm not scared for that, but oh, if I know to do something better, I would rather do something better. That's why I'm here. Do you now, think I'm retired now and I'm not farming anymore. Do you think the government turns a blind eye to the murders of white farmers? Yeah, I personally think so. You know, we had a system uh, in place way back, we call the commander system. And they were very, very much helpful to the farmers, but then they disbanded them all. And they've left everything over just for the police. But I think the farmers now are co coordinating with each other, and they are doing the most of the job in order to catch some of these culprits. So the farmers are now kind of acting as their own police force. Yeah, I think so, yeah. In fact, some of these farmers had added me into WhatsApp groups, where over months I've seen the reports of attacks, the theft and killing of livestock, gunfights in the streets, and of course, farm murders. In these groups, I saw firsthand the lengths of coordination these farmers must go to in order to deal with their situation alone. The Specialized Crime Unit in Port Elizabeth took over the case, and I really believe if they weren't involved, we wouldn't have got as far as we have got. But now they've been told this is specialized crime. They've been told not to do farm, farm murders anymore. They're not allowed to do farm murders. Yes. They, they, my dad's case was the last case they were allowed to do. Why? The government. The government has, has said they, the serious crime, can't, can't look at farm murders anymore. These stories of government failure are heartbreaking. Not least of all because these farmers are left feeling helpless and alone. I was due to move on to the last leg of my journey when I was introduced to a man named Louis, who lost everything in a drought that hit his region. Basically, we are in a drought and the state has declared it a disaster. They allocated 375,000 to our district, but it did not reach us. Nobody knows where the money is, but it has obviously been stolen and it's made everything much worse. Louis showed me around his farm where the effects of the drought were a striking sight. I can't afford to pump the water out of the ground anymore. It has gotten me into massive debt. It's no longer even affordable to run my machinery, pump the water, or go to the wholesaler and buy the basic ingredients to feed my cattle and maintain the farms. It is all totally pointless. My farm used to be a green oasis. It used to be a healthy, perfect farm. Now it has all turned to dust, to barren wasteland, with piles of bones from the sheep I once had, who died of thirst. Over the past few years, the South African government has used its black economic empowerment policy to coerce utility companies into depleting the number of white workers to reflect the racial makeup of the country. In reality, this means that companies with government contracts 
must shoot for a goal of a workforce with no more than 8% white workers. Since these mass layoffs, filling engineering and other high-skilled positions has been difficult, only worsening the water crisis and causing serious ramifications for the country's white farming minority. I could no longer afford to maintain my old home, so it fell into disrepair, and we now live in a much smaller shack down the road. There is nothing left of that house. The floors have rotted, the walls are breaking. The place my children were born, the place my wife and I built from scratch and used to love, it is now just rubble. This is happening to everyone, everywhere here. You drive up and down these lands, and all you can see is dilapidated farms. There are extremely difficult times laying ahead for us. Everything points towards them trying to break us. In a nation so dependent on these farms for its food and for some of its major exports like Angora mohair, it's hard to believe the government is doing so little to help, or worse, as some are speculating, purposely withholding aid as they battle with farmers for the land. The whole objective of the government is to make it very difficult economically. Through fuel and property taxes, they are overtaxing us on everything. Like everyone in South Africa, our lives are turning to ruin, and they are doing it to us on purpose. The government here feel nothing for us. They want us starving or dead. It is a strategy they have been working on for years. It's hard working here every day, knowing they are going to chase you out in six months. The government even said openly they are going to take our land. I will never recover from this. I just hope my children can have a better life one day. Spending time with Louis on his dying farm has been a truly heart-wrenching experience. Not only are these farmers forced to live with the constant fear of break-ins and some of the most gruesome crimes imaginable, but every day has been a struggle even just for the survival of the very land to which they are so deeply rooted. To make matters worse, if the government follows through with their promises, Louis will shortly be losing all his land as well. Listening to Louis describe his situation was surreal. It was far too removed from the reasonable middle ground I expected to find between the left and the right's posturing of the issues facing South Africa. Only days after leaving South Africa, I saw Louis's fears vindicated in Parliament. The ANC announced they would absolutely be taking white land by force, expropriation without compensation. Even the ANC's most famous leader, Nelson Mandela, a known radical communist, at least believed in the concept of compensation. He didn't even propose a motion this extreme. This will be the first time in modern South Africa we see something like this play out. In fact, all of South Africa's political parties have steadily become more radical in their approach. The EFF, which holds 10% of the vote, are notorious for singing an anti-apartheid song at their rallies, calling for the deaths of white farmers. The situation has now become so dire that nations like Australia have begun considering giving refugee status to white farmers while others within South Africa hold mass protests before the plasmord, the Afrikaans' word for farm murders, reaches a point of no return. I began to wonder if the remoteness of their farms simply made these farmers an easy target, or if other white South Africans faced the same problem. So I met with Liz, 
a businesswoman with a successful paintball field and shop near Port Elizabeth. I've probably had over 100 break-ins at my business in the last 10 years. I've been in uh, two armed robberies at my work, so as we were closing, guys just roll in and basically pull out a gun and take all your stuff. Um, in one of the armed robberies, um, one of the guys was beating me with a metal pipe over my head so that, like, you just uh, shut up and be quiet and, like, just subdue any... Um, yeah, you just, um, they basically just don't tell you to be quiet, they just make you be quiet. You mentioned to us earlier that many of your sales are more for self-defense paintball guns. Can you explain that? Basically, a lot of people are getting robbed these days at their homes and at their work and they buy paintball guns with solid balls and pepper balls because it's a non-lethal defense form. You don't need a license. Getting a gun license in South Africa is very time consuming, very costly, and you're not guaranteed that you're actually going to get a license. So a lot of people are buying paintball guns from us to basically shoot anyone who's on their property or trying to get on their property with a solid ball that's basically made of nylon or fiberglass and it's a like a deterrent. Things have gotten so bad that Liz has been forced to bring armed security for her daily cash out. Sometimes yeah when we're busy then like my dad will come to the range and basically bring his gun and then we just have that as a extra precautionary measure because like you never know what's going to happen. It's like the Wild West at times. Some people watch Wild West movies. There's days where you feel like you're in your own Wild West movie in Africa. Just days after visiting Liz, she was the victim of another armed break-in. Like many other white South Africans, she has now decided to close down her business and attempt to leave the country. South Africa's white population has fallen by 23,000 in the last year. And with the recent surge in murders and the announcement of land expropriation, that number is expected to skyrocket before the end of 2018. To get to the bottom of why this was happening, I wanted to meet some of the nation's policymakers to hear their side of the story. So I managed to secure an interview with Tabo Mokwena, a powerful businessman and a member of the ruling party's provincial executive committee, and someone I have been advised is a major force within the African National Congress. So there's been like very slow progress in terms of addressing the land or redistributing the land. So, so we must speed up. And it's not the question that government does not have money for compensation or there is no money for compensation in the system. I think it's just part of the problem is that the bureaucracy is way too slow and then it undermines, you know, um, the good objective. So you need to have like cutthroat departments that understand the agency and the plight of the people when they are required to do their work they must do it are things leaning more towards with or without compensation <laughs> i don't know i'm just curious yeah. look the, the the decision that has been taken it's without compensation there's nothing that government can do that is illegal to the farmers. Neither there is nothing that the farmers can refuse, which is, uh, which is law. So they don't have much options. It is not the intention of the ANC um, to go and grab the land illegally and then that type of thing. No. We will do it within the prescripts of the laws of this particular country. And then if it means that the laws of this country are not adequate to address that, the first thing to do is to introduce the new laws that allows us to be able to. But once it's law, no farmer, no um, person that can come and say that I am going to uh, disobey this law. No, do it at your own peril. 
This seems to be the official party line. Don't worry, everything is fine. Ignore, cover up, and don't mention it. But former financial advisor to the ANC turned political activist Simon Roach has spoken out against this approach in recent years. We, our economy is imploding. Um, our, the value of our currency has deteriorated dramatically, almost unbelievably. We've been downgraded to junk status. We have an official unemployment rate of about 38% just over 38%, but an unofficial, in other words, the non-government sources say that it is certainly 50%. We have about 16.3 million, in fact, 16.3 million people on social grants and an income tax base of 3.1 million people. Taken together, these are the reasons we believe there will be a civil war. And I'd like to add a final anecdote we recently had a protest in South Africa against farm murders. Uh, called, the protest was called Black Monday. And afterwards, our Minister of Defense said that if whites stage another such protest, they will bring a civil war upon themselves. They will provoke a genocide. Like the wider situation in South Africa, my conversation with Tabo quickly became messy and confusing Something I began to believe was a tactic to avoid confronting the reality of the situation. The implications of this tactic became increasingly concerning throughout my trip. To simply ignore racial tensions, economic and energy crises, and of course the farm murders seemed shockingly irresponsible as the evidence on the ground continued to mount. It was at this point that I discovered another phenomenon sweeping the country, white squatter camps. So I went to one such site to investigate it for myself. This squatter camp, just outside the nation's capital, is one of many across South Africa and is home to some of the country's most disadvantaged people, many of whom have struggled to find work, basic medical care, or even shelter because of the country's black economic empowerment laws. It is built on the site of an old dumping ground and is home to around 60 people, most of whom are children. We're okay to film? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. All right, this is Donnie. He's gonna be your tour guide. Tour guide, your tour guide yeah. Hi, Donnie, nice to meet you. Yeah, well, the place is about uh, people that is, haven't got place to stay, that stays on the street. So we help them, and there's some of the people that is coming in that's got uh, drug problems and all that. We help them with it, and especially women that is abused with children, and we help them with that. That is uh, what we are doing here. So, and from the public side outside, we don't get any support. So the men here, we all, we are working. We love to do it because especially women and children, they don't get any support from the government. They don't get support. And we haven't got power or lights, uh, electricity we haven't got yet. That's why we've got water, but Kubis is supporting us with the water, so he's paying that damages out of his pocket. Could you tell us just in simple terms why this is here? Because there's no help for whites in South Africa, not so all, nothing. So our whites land on the streets, they run to squatter camps because they know there's food and clothes. That's why I started it. Who builds these houses? You guys do? Ourselves. Yeah. We do it ourselves. We do it ourselves. This is one guy stay there. Look mm. at this room. One guy. So without this place open, where would these kids be? They will be on the streets. Or they will be in foster or they will be in somebody's else care. Then the government doesn't have a whole lot of programs? No, nothing, 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 nothing. Well, there are poor people of all races in South Africa. People here are often refused help based solely on their race. 
Miss Grace, the de facto mother of the camp, told me how one resident was refused treatment at a hospital because of the color of his skin, while children in the camp were refused places at a local school for the same reason. There's nothing with, uh, in, I think, in 1990, yeah, 2001. It was stipulated from the government, no support to any whites whatsoever. No aid, nothing. Why couldn't you go to one of the hostels that the government has set up? Because of the skin color. Yeah, and yeah, it's not, well, we just help white people, yeah. Because there's not the place that does it. You know, if you go to this place, there's many places I know, um, Jesus Disciples, uh, Manger, those places they take blacks and they put the whites out. You see, so, yeah, that's about it. So wait, you, there are places here that will only help blacks but won't help whites? Yeah, that's true. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like, I, people find that a very bizarre idea. Um, yeah, if you, I don't know how to say it, it's just the racism going around. So, I'm just here to get my life in order and try to give my daughter a better life. <laughs> Were there any other places you could have gone other than here? <laughs> no. Why not? Nobody else didn't want to help. I've tried a lot and at the end of the day, Uncle Kubis was the only one that took me in. This is the only place you could help us with. It's a place to stay and things. They are the only ones who helped us with it. it no one else for, wanted. If it wasn't for them, I would have been in the street. I want to sleep with my wife and my kids on street. That's it. Today I'm suffering because of people who is like racist with us. And they don't care about our young people because you can't get jobs in them with. Because this side of the earth is it's bad for us. And I'm not lying, it's really it's bad. No one can get jobs around you, we're suffering badly. Even the youngest kids. I've got, I've got a five-year-old, two-year-old. I don't know how I'm going to give them a life at Rancho. Well, where we lived, things were very dangerous. The one day, um, there was black people walking in the street and they shot through our windows. And I went and the police did nothing. You can't even walk in the streets around, around at night during the day. They always rapes, uh, rape you or they beat you up. They're swearing at you in the language, you, you, they know you don't know the language, but they will come and swear at you, but you're breaking you down around you. You know, you don't feel like a person around you anymore. So they're making sure our people, it's, we don't have a life anymore. They will make sure about it. This is just one of dozens of camps like it in South Africa, a growing testament to the resentment the country's white population now faces. In order to learn more about why anti-white racism is thriving in the country, I spoke to the deputy president of Black First Land First, one of South Africa's more radical political parties. Last year, Andile Mkitama founded the Black First Land First which he says aims to put land and the economy back in the hands of black South Africans. BLF is taking... We have to fight in order to attain freedom as the black majority in this country. And the fight has to be located in taking back the land and expropriating it back into the people, in seizing the means of production and expropriating everything, or rather redistributing everything equally. A society that would embody a value system that puts black people first will have to be attained through, 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 through confrontation, unfortunately, through confrontation, unfortunately, because our people have waited for so long, right? We've waited for so long, uh, peaceful, and, and, and nothing is happening in terms of changing our lived experience, right? In fact, the settlers know that very well. So we are already at war. We are already at war. We are, our people are at war in farms now. 
White people and persons like Breitenbach are land thieves and they have no stake to the society and the black majority understands that and we will respond accordingly. I think black people have been patient enough for more than 400 years of colonialism and we don't want you to feel pity for us. We are coming for you and we are going to get everything that you own. It's ours. It's ours. It's ours. During my trip, I was worried to see views like these so readily accepted and even celebrated on television and in the print media, particularly given the truth of the history of the Boer people. But is there a solution? I've been told about a remote town with virtually no crime, where the people are content to be separate from the rest of the country. They even have their own currency. Now, what's interesting about this town, and probably one of the biggest reasons it is criticized, is that it is the one place in the world where, by law, only white people are allowed to live. Naturally, I was intrigued and wanted to find out more. So I took a trip to Orania, a town in Northern Cape Province, to find out more. While in Orania, I managed to secure an interview with the mayor. My guide explained to me that Mr. Boshoff had turned down interview requests from mainstream news outlets like CNN and BBC. So I took the rare opportunity to sit down and discuss his vision for the town on camera. The Waronia movement is 30 years old uh, this year. Um, it was created in 1988 when it was quite clear that minority government in South Africa was unsustainable and that some agreement needed to be reached with the majority of the population. One line of thinking was that human rights and constitutional uh, guarantees would suffice to look after Afrikaners' interest in, in South Africa. It was clear to us and our uh, leaders at that time that it would not be sufficient, that uh, um, in Africa especially a constitution is not always worth the paper that it's written on, and that we really needed uh, something more structural, more concrete. One thing that really stands out here is the near total lack of crime. Everywhere I went, people left their cars unlocked with the windows down. I was struck by the sight of a moped with the keys left in the ignition all afternoon in a country with some of the highest crime rates in the world. Let me say with a certain amount of, of uh, um, pride that if it's not zero, it's cl quite close to zero. And um, there are petty crimes of, of, of different kinds in, in any community. But in terms of, of the crime wave that, that is all over South Africa, we don't have anything of that kind. And there's different ways in which you could uh, reach the point of a close to zero uh, crime rate. And we have succeeded in doing that. This single white enclave has been the subject of international derision for its apparently racist mission to keep Afrikaner culture alive. But what I soon realized is that the concept behind this town was no different to that of the Black Tribal Homelands, an area of land 10,000 times the size of Arania that South Africa's white minority are still forbidden to live on today. Um, it's, it's no more racist than any black community of which there are literally thousands in South Africa. And I say that because we don't define ourselves in the first uh, um, instance in terms of race, but in terms of culture and language and, and a whole tradition. To people in the West, this town may seem bizarre, but it's clear that like many other places in South Africa, and indeed the world, the people of Arania consider the threat to their culture great enough to take extraordinary steps to ensure its survival. But on your movement members uh, um, are uh, more than 5,000 at the moment. So it's small, it's relatively small. But nonetheless, we've created a kind of alternative that is ready to grow. 
I was certainly struck by the sense of peace in Arania, something which stood in stark contrast to many of the other towns I visited while in South Africa. Arania is just one potential solution to this crisis, and for the people living there, it seems to be working. On and off camera, many people, both black and white, did suggest segregation as a potential solution to this crisis. And even more worrying is the growing number of people preparing for a race-based civil war if another solution cannot be found. Simon is now one of the senior members of the Sightlanders, the world's largest non-state civil defense force a network of around 200,000 members who believe a civil war is coming and their only option is to be prepared. Simon invited me to the home of one of its members to take a look at the kind of preparations yep. these people are making. Okay, so these are the preparations of the Erasmus family, which includes um, a hydroponic system to be taken with them in their vehicles in the event of a civil war, a nationwide anarchy crisis. And these will be laid in their vehicles and taken down so that they can start uh, crops from scratch in any remote area as long as there's water. So they have five, five cars in their clan, you could say, and then they have that truck. Um, that will carry a whole lot of stuff. When they move out, they're, they're building a sort of canopy for the truck for refugees that they will pick up. It's obviously just in the early stages. And that's a dryer for all the veggies. You can even dry meat inside it, you know, and um, to prepare that food. You know, that can keep us two, three years, definitely. The family doesn't use it. Um, for its day-to-day -day use, it's specifically a preparation for a nationwide anarchy situation. The scale and thoroughness of these preparations would make you think the apocalypse is just around the corner, but Simon assured me that these were only the preparations of one of thousands of others across the country prepping in the same way. In fact, every year the Sightlanders hold a huge evacuation drill where different groups from across South Africa carry out a complex run-through of their plan for when civil war breaks out, something they believe is inevitable. All this talk of civil war seemed extreme, so I asked Simon how he thought South Africa could go down such a dark path. I think, Lauren, that it would be a very spontaneous, sudden thing, for the simple reason that South Africa is a bubbling cauldron at the moment. Um, you have seen across South Africa these spontaneous events where people run into a bunch of H&M stores and smash them down. You've seen for yourself this very morning, um, we arrived on the scene a very short while after a uh, nature conservation facility had been burnt to the ground by disgruntled uh, neighbours. Perhaps it was people who felt that they were owed more jobs or something, we don't know. These things happen so quickly. And so many people are embittered at the moment. Our government is woefully unable to provide modest governance. The Sightlanders have been criticized by mainstream politicians and media alike for their dramatic approach in dealing with the country's problems. But as the crime wave deepens and the government's anti-white rhetoric is now being realized in legislation to take white land, I have to wonder if we were in their shoes, would we be compelled to act in the same way? And could the Sightlanders be preparing for what is becoming an ever more realistic bloody future in South Africa? What I found most striking about their preparations was that we did not uncover a mass amount of weapons or offensive materials. Instead, we came upon first aid kits, a hydroponic system, and plenty of survival equipment. In fact, every year the Sightlanders hold a huge evacuation drill where different groups across South Africa carry out a complex run-through of their plan for when civil war breaks out, something they believe is inevitable. Lauren, Sightlanders organization is the first line 
and the last line of defense in the event that our worst fears are realized and a race-based civil war engulfs South Africa. If the choice is between segregation and civil war, the future for all South Africans looks bleak. But there is perhaps a third option. Why don't white South Africans just leave? Well, this third option is far more complex than it may appear. There's, there's no way for the average South African to leave South Africa. Um, you must have, in most of these uh, cases, $300,000. That's six million rand. A normal South African doesn't make six million rand. So uh, there's, there's just no way for the normal South African to leave. The Afrikaner people are not recent migrants. Their South African roots date back hundreds of years. They have evolved their own language, their own culture, and are living on land that their families have farmed for generations. Land that was not stolen. I don't blame those that want to stay. There is something biblical about South Africa. You can feel it in the air. Their history lives in the very soil they work every single day, and many will not be convinced to leave it so easily. Beyond this, for those who do wish to leave South Africa, the process and costs have made it nearly impossible for the most vulnerable to travel beyond its borders. If I can get a chance, I will go. If I can get a better life that side of the seas, I will go. Me and my two kids, I need a life to make for them. Because my life is ruined because I don't have a job, there's nothing out there. I want something to happen for them because they're still young. I need to get that for them to have a life. Because if they don't have a life, what, what is going to happen? The blacks is going to kill my kids. There was rumors around here. They said it's going to come in, I don't know when. The, I don't know which, um, like Zuma or what, you know, I don't know if it's Zuma or what, Malema or what kind, said if it takes over. He's going to kill our what? Despite having never seen anything quite so beautiful as the stars in the South African night sky or the vast landscapes of the farmlands, I was relieved to come back home It's no life to live, putting your children to bed behind gated doors and cell block windows. Having to sleep with pepper spray under your pillow or a gun on your nightstand. Leaving this place is a luxury these people do not have. My South African journey came to an end while the people I met are stuck in a home that no longer welcomes them, where they must fight to justify their very existence to a hostile majority. Does this amount to genocide? Not yet, but according to organizations like Genocide Watch and taking into account everything I have seen and heard on the ground, South Africa is stepping closer to that reality every single day. But could there be a light at the end of the tunnel? 
Coverage of the issue has thrown these farmers and the wider boar population into the global spotlight, as mainstream media like Fox News, BBC, and even CNN have begun to report on this crisis. And with this story set to play out on the world stage, it will be for South Africans to face their future. But now, at least one thing is certain. With the world awakening to the plight of these people, they won't be facing it alone. going to happen. It's like the Wild West at times. Some people watch Wild West movies. There's days where you feel like you're in your own Wild West movie. 